want to follow in job products. For the last year, I've been working as a delivery lead for Equal Express. Well, right now, let me tell you about a bit of my musical journey, which is quite important for the agile part of it. So, one of the things that this journey has is resilience. As you will see, the easiest way always is to give up. It has changes. Life is made of changes. So does the agile transformation path. So you can, if you cannot live with this, as Marco was saying, well, agile is not for you. And essentially, it's a path of trial and error. You will fail. Suck it up. It's part of life. Okay, just try to fail fast, and that's one of the things that I will constantly remain during the presentation. I failed a lot. Okay. So a bit of my, my history since an early age, as you can see, I like music and apparently blues. Uh, well, I wasn't into glam rock, but the thing that that rock taught me was that the fun you can have with it. And I was lucky enough not to study the violin. Uh, but I was lucky enough to live nearby a music school and for my mom to pay it for me to study in a music school. Uh, although I was a misfit, so uh, they said I had no ear at all for music. Uh, so at 12, uh, I said to my mom, I'm in a music school, but well, they say I'm very bad at the music part, so can you buy me some piano lessons? There was this lovely lady nearby. I only took a couple of them, so piano is not my thing. Apparently, it was guitars, and I have one like this. So, it was in guitars that I felt really comfortable, and I started playing it at the age of 14. I don't know if anyone else plays guitar or not. Um, but, just to give you a bit more context, we were talking about the 90s, uh, and MTV was big at that time. And I would say up like it wasn't about Jersey Shores, but it had a really good problem for someone who likes rock and metal. It was Headbangers Ball. And so I stayed, I, had, I was lucky enough to have a TV in my room, and I stayed up very late to see the, the metal video clips at Headbangers Ball. But there are some things that do the triggers, as Marco was saying a lot about the brain, what triggered me uh, into the music and, and started comp composing. So there was a couple of records that definitely changed my life. So these two, back at the beginning of the 90s, in 91, so the Black Album by Metallica, they were already big uh, at that time, uh, but they started filling up stadiums and Nirvana Nevermind, which became the, the big grunge record. Still, it wasn't by this time that I started feeling the, the, the urge to compose. It was because of these two records, two Portuguese bands. So in uh, 95, Blind Zero's Trigger, <coughs> which is still for me one of the best Portuguese rock records, and uh, 1996, Irreligious by Moonspell. Moonspell. They celebrated the 20th anniversary this weekend in Camp Pequeno. Of course, I was there. Uh, two great records that made me pick up the guitar. Okay, so I said, well, these guys are Portuguese. They are playing abroad. They can do it. I know how to play some chords. Why can't I? So, at the age of 15, uh, I created a band. I think there's no photos of it. It was called No Sense. The band didn't make any sense at all. But they were <laughs> my colleagues from the music school. So, I have here a bunch of guys. Let's, let's, let's do it. Then it evolved into No Soul. It was basically the same band with a different name. Uh, we released the demo. This is back in the 90s, so it wasn't that easy to expose music. It was about cassette trend trading uh, and uh, some compilations, so it was cool for that time, we sold like 200 or 300 uh, demos. Then I stopped music, I went to college and my mom said, ah, oh, now forget about music, you have to study, and I tried to be a good son and said, okay, I'll leave my strats, getting some rust in, in the corner. So I got graduated, then started working uh, at SAPU, then I got married, and, it, and essentially it was my wife that told me to get back to music. She saw that when we moved from, to our house, I brought to my strat, and it was full of, of rust. And she said, well, you have a big passion for playing, and you, you are still a music addict. Why don't you come back? You have a couple of friends. One is here that uh, Ricardo that played in the next band I'll present with me. And I said, why don't you talk to them and, well, start playing? <laughs> I said, OK. So, we created Public Perfect, which was named after an Interpol song. 
Um, and we released one EP, it was a big fail, so we decided not to release. Well, Ricardo was laughing because he remembers how it sounded. Uh, then we decided as a trio with no vocalist to, to, to create the, that EP. This is the single. And uh, we managed to gather several vocalists from, from different bands that recorded with us. We got a small record label to launch. But when we were supposed to record, uh, to, to do a full, a full record, we split it. Okay, that was not meant to be. So basically, I was I was left essentially I was the main composer, so I was left with a with a with a, an album full of material in my hands. And what could I do with this? So I was like, no, uh, no, no, music it's not for me again. But my wife is pretty stubborn, so she said, no, no, no. You love music, you love what you're doing, but try to make it. Think of a different approach you can do it. Okay? Perhaps play solo. Said, okay, why not? Let me try to compose in a different way. So, what was the trigger this time? I don't know if you know Anonymous. Okay, so I saw an article about Anonymous. I was like, okay, let me write the music about Anonymous and do a different approach. So, I got some recordings from uh, Anonymous, and the chorus of the song is their. their uh, Lemma, uh, and uh, I sent a shitty demo to a guy that I met online. That he he he's a producer, uh, and he plays in several bands. And I said, "Well, I have this song. Do you want to play with me and produce the song?" He said, "Yeah, okay, let's do it. I liked what you said. It's different. Let's do it." And so we released uh, "We Are Anonymous" as as a single, and we released a video uh, for it, all with the help of people I didn't know, I knew through the internet, and it was uh, a, um, a lot of the anonymous on the different countries spread the song, because it was all about the anonymous. But how did it evolve? So this is back when I was 16 and recording the demos with some, a lot of extra pounds on top of me, but the guy on the left still plays with me, and I know him since the, I'm three years old. Uh, so he played in almost all of the bands that I played. And uh, he lives nearby, so one day I met him in the subway and said, oh, uh, and he asked me, oh, are you still playing? I said, ah, no, I'm doing a solo work, I don't know, but, well, send me some demos, well, what do you have? And he said, well, I always liked your composition, so why don't we start playing together? But not as a full band. Let's start the two of us and let's do baby steps. Step by step. And I said, okay, let's do it. And things were going okay, we, f we believed in the song, so... But the thing was, with the other band bands, some things were not working. So, uh, I had to have a different vision on whether we, we wanted to go. And, like this guy, he gave a vision to America, okay? He's a rock star for me. Unfortunately, this guy is too. Okay? And that's what, what sold. And that's what I needed. I need to gather people around the dream uh, of the music. And that's how, with, it started with a different name, as you could see in the single, but that's how we became uh, Secret Symmetry. We started in 2013, and by 2014, we had nine songs, and we recorded this EP with a record with five songs, with Fernand Matias, who is best known for working with Moonspell, Linda Martini, and the guy who did the design works with a lot of fans, so it was really good. Uh, and after one month, well, let's come back a bit. What, when I finished the recording, what did well? So I don't like, I do prefer lessons learned to post-mortem, as a lot of people use, but what could we improve more? And that's what we're using right now on the, the record we're recording right now, but that's, I'll leave that to a bit later. At the end of 2015, Emerge, the EP, uh, was on a lot of uh, underground uh, music clubs, uh, which was very cool and a surprise for us. Uh, and so this was a bit of the energy that was lacking before for us to move on. Uh, this is uh, Secret Symmetry nowadays, but let's, this is the story. So let's, let's go to the Agile part of it. So this is basically what happens in every project team. And a band is really a project team. So there's a guy that essentially does 99% of the work. And, and if you saw the movie, 
He says he's going to help, but he's not. He disappears at the beginning, shows it in the end, and yay, everybody, yeah, great. He has no idea what's going on the whole time. Okay? This happens a lot in the bands. So, but you think, oh, Agile, so he's doing Agile in the band, but are all the guys from IT, do they know what Scrum, Kanban, TDD, Lean, Pairing, and all the things? No. And I'll present the band right now. So the bassist is a pastry chef. I'm a delivery lead. The keyboardist, it's a financial controller. The vocalist, she's an exploration geologist. And the drummer is a commercial director for an animal food company. Okay? So one of the things that we agreed after DP was we have to have a goal. Like the definition of done. When we are done to make a record. When we have 9 to 10 songs composed, about around 50 minutes, when it should shoot a studio, producer, pre-producer songs and are finished, then thumbs up. And we had an inspiration. The album that we're recording, it's based on the Philip Zimbardo, the Lucifer's effect, how good people turn evil. Another thing that we have taught, not only in the stand-ups, but it's difficult with all of these different lives to get in a room. So we do it weekly, but we can find ways to work remotely. So we exchange songs, we use, I won't go through all these tools, but this is just the basic we use. And some of them don't use it on a daily basis. So the thing was, how can I get them to use this? And nowadays they use it. It was a long path to get here. Another thing is, oh, how does this guy incorporate this in, in, a, in, a, in a rehearsal? So basically uh, the thing is, uh, I basically propose that for us we have like two hours to play and everybody wants to be there and play. That's why you want loud music. Uh, but we, need, we have the bureaucracy that every band needs to move forward. So we dedicate usually 10 minutes and we have a board online that everybody can, can see it and the face is moved. This is on Trello. Uh, you can use it forever or in the, even in the rehearsal room with post-its. But that's the way everybody's on board and they have tasks. They have, so everybody has the bureaucracy and not 99% the guy on the left from that picture of every project team. Another thing that's quite important, and this is the third time I do this presentation, I always change a lot of the slides. And on the first one, there was uh, a colleague of mine that said, well, no, no, you didn't talk about creativity. I said, okay, this looks like a work, okay. It's not a workflow, but perhaps it is. But it's not a formula, okay. Oops. It's art, or at least every musician likes to believe it is. If you're a toy, you'll probably have a, a process. He has, believe me. Uh, so, it's, it's, sometimes it's weird as a musician because I, I, sometimes I go on the tube or in the car or even on the street and I recall a riff and I try to go to a corner and record it and I found it, oh, am I weird? And I sent to Google Drive to have an archive of it but then I read on some blog post that it, it was a musician thing. So the creative process is like that. Well, sometimes it is if you think of art. Well, not like this, at least for me. This is too pretty for being the process. And this happens a lot. This is awesome. Now this is tricky. Ah, oh, this is shit. I am shit. Think that I have a guy that I send, usually one of my bandmates, I send the music and he says, ah, this might be okay. And then some of the things that become awesome. So I decided to draw how do we work, usually. And it has a process. That's how we work. So usually I start, I send the music to the keyboard player, that guy that was when we were 16 on the picture, and he says, well, I think this has potential or not, even if I say it's, it's shit, but I, I even though I send it to him. Then we have what sometimes we can call the four eyes. So we walk into the whole band, the instrumental part, and then, uh, then the vocalist comes in. That's how we made it work. And then it was a pre-production. It's a song, okay? So basically with this, I, I, I try to do a top 10 of tips and tricks that can function not only on a rock band. So changes in team members, as you asked Marco, uh, unfortunately, I had to do more often than Marco that, uh, and that happens in a band. In our Maiden, it happened too. Uh, so but, uh, we lost two members after the, the following EP, EP. One of them went to work to Oporto, and one the, another one we fired. It didn't work. We fired him. Uh, and this is like refactoring a bit of how the band worked. Worked. And then we changed from a male vocalist to female vocalist, and changed the basses. But 
band goes on. That's the, the biggest part. Uh, I don't know if you ever read Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell, from Malcolm Gladwell, but he gives an example that happened in the uh, uh, 1990s. A team of psychologists in, in Germany uh, studied violin students. And they started to play at the, five, uh, five, uh, the age of five, and then at the age of, of eight, they one, one, some of them start playing more time and others less. And when they had 20, oh, there was a complete difference. So it's not only inspiration, it's practice. And that's a big part of how the Beatles became big. It's when they moved from the UK, went to Germany to play, and when they came, they had the muscle to play. So you need to practice a lot. It's sweat, okay? In the rehearsal room, yeah, effectively sweat, no air condition. Um, decision making, it's a thing, you can have a leader, but at least you should communicate and involve everybody on board. So if you have everybody on board, you will get things done, at least in a band. Uh, shift happens. So what happened to us? Uh, you have to be prepared for this all the time. Uh, when we were supposed to enter the studio in October, but the foot of the drummer uh, broke. Well, so we had to cancel, postpone, and rearrange everything. At the 11th hour, it happens. You just have to be prepared. Another thing, and this is a tip I learned from my wife, silence is golden. So discussions occur when it's even teams at home, in a band, because everybody has the right to have an opinion, okay? Free country. Uh, and sometimes silence is very important to resolve conflict, so don't, don't use your head when it's really hot, so calm down and try to rethink things. The producer has a BA. This is um, Jeff Patton that I believe you, you use to the user mapping. He uses this as an example. I don't know if you know this guy. This is Dave Grohl from Nirvana and Foo Fighters. That is one of the biggest producers that is Rick Rubin. He worked with Slayer, System of a Down, Metallic, Eminem, and Uncle Jay, a lot of people. And it's quite important sometimes for you to have, as in a project, someone that is not inside uh, your team or your music group that will help you explore the, the music in a different approach or direction. Okay? Team has a collective, and Marco already mentioned this, but you can have a team of Cristiano Ronaldo's, but if they don't work together, you don't have a team. And the same with the band. So if you're pushing to different sides, you won't get music done. And especially when you play live, and you have a very bad s stage sound, it's very important for you to play as a team. Make changes often. That's one of the things that not only in, on my profession has a delivery, I like to do, but in my band too. So sometimes we change where we play, and we, we move things not only the way we do it, the way we approach, but even on the rehearsal room. We change things around. Sometimes I play near the keyboard player, sometimes I change near the drums. Everybody rotates. So to get different approaches of the sound, it's a small room. Prototyping. So, if you want to compare it to, to IT, it can be uh, similar to test-driven development. So, uh, you can test your ideas, we exchange ideas, models, you can test it in a room, or actually small parts in the room. This is our rehearsal room uh, um, wall. So, that way you can see if it works or not, rearrange it and move forward. And this is the most important thing. Have fun. It is fundamental that you live the experience and have fun. So, uh, most of you may know the, the Agile Software Development Manifesto, in visuals and interactions of processing tools, working software of comprehensive, comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration of a contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. So I decided to do that rocking agile manifesto. So basically, <laughs> individuals and interactions over instruments and egos, this is very important. Working songs over too much discussion on music theory, that bores the hell out of me. Uh, band collaboration over one-man show, that I learned from experience and failing, and embrace change over following a plan. You can have a path, a goal, but you need change will happen. So what follows next? Well, right now, we started then at the beginning of January uh, on Dynamic Studios in, Lis in Lisbon, and uh, that's uh, Topica from Ram, Process of Guilt, and uh, several rock bands recorded there. So we recorded the drums, the guitar, 
the bass, and the keys. And we decided to take a break in the middle of this. Uh, so it's basically always a work in progress. And then in March, come back to record the vocals, mix, and master. Okay? But the most important thing that, uh, that I want you, it's almost finished, but it's make it work. It doesn't mean to be in IT, which well, most, you always talk about the agile, mostly in IT, but you can do it in HR, in a band, it's just inspect and adapt. If you're looking at the agile books, and you talk a lot about this, just make it work. It can happen, you just need to, to adapt. Sometimes when I, I do consultancy, so they go, oh, but that is not Scrum. And it works better than the way you're doing. Uh, uh, apparently, yes. So let, at least let's try. Trust in me. Let's try. And if it works, oh, yeah, you cannot put a label on this. Just call it agile, whatever. It works better. Let's do it. Okay? Well, thank you very much and rock on. <laughs>
because they're in different stages of maturity. No camera at all. One usually takes two minutes. Some of them take 10. Uh, sometimes I do quizzes. It has an energizer. You get to know the person on the other side because you've never seen his face, but you get to know that his favorite TV series is Vikings or Game of Thrones, or he's, he's done a lot of stuff because I do a daily question. And it's really good, at least for the first month, to get to know each other, even though we are not together. That can happen. So that's why it's so important for you to have always on board. And if the team I have over there, I don't let the, the guys fall asleep or nothing like that, but I usually in the do, uh, do even leaner uh, approaches on, on, the, on, the, on the daily stand-up. So it's just sort of the two questions. Are you blocked by anything? Or uh, do you have anything to share? If not, go, goodbye, see you tomorrow. Okay, because if you have a good board, you don't need the questions, okay? It's just to talk two minutes, and I need to take that offline. And the guys loved it. It was one of the guys said, oh, they, sorry to, to mess around with your, oh, with your call, but it's, uh, oh, this stand-up, it's so boring, man. Yeah. And I don't want to talk about today, <laughs> yesterday. Don't you know how you guys have, don't you know how to read it? It's not post-its. Yeah. It's a travel board. And yeah, okay, it's true. And it's boring for me, too, because I don't want to ask you anything at all. So I can read it, but do you want to share anything that's significant for this time that we're talking? No, I'll move, I'll move on. And once I have it, you have a direct line with the customer. That's it, and it works. Probably on junior teams that don't, don't want to work together for a long time, that can happen, that will need more support. But the thing is, and it's a really about the brain, it's the power of habit. You have to insist, insist, insist like a coach at the beginning, but once they get it, it's automatic. They don't think at all. Seven weeks. Yeah, seven I don't know weeks if it's seven weeks, weeks but... Next, next to something that happens, you yeah. have to do it every day for seven weeks. That's yeah, and after that, you can, can take the wheels out of the bicycle. Yeah. And no hands, go. That's the main goal, I believe, as a... Well, you can call Scrum Master or a job coach or whatever, it just depends on the company. I believe, for me, at least, that's the main goal you can get. It's to put the team autonomous. But that's my vision, okay? I don't know if I answered your question. But... Just one more question. Okay, there we go. Uh, does your wife fly like your music? Or, uh... No, 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 no. <laughs> Neither my daughter. She's, it's screaming and very loud, but in, at home I play with my headphones. That was, well, the assumption they did. Oh, yeah, you can play at home with headphones. Yeah, but they went to see a concert and said, yeah, yeah, put some tampons on. <laughs> and look at that, and it was like that. No, they don't like my music, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you very much.